you think it's better like this or should I put in uh Hi everyone. Your, My your name pods. is Mark Steben, I'm the president of IUSCI okay. uh, Canada. And I welcome you to this uh, monthly uh, webinar. Uh, for this uh, November webinar, we have uh, Professor Isaac Bogosh, and the discussion will be HIV post-exposure prophylaxis in pocket, or PEP in pocket, or PIP. Please, Professor Bogosh. Hi, everyone. Lovely to be here. And thank you so much for the invitation to chat today about HIV post-exposure prophylaxis in pocket, also known as PEP in pocket. We're calling it PIP, just as an easy way to remember it. But um, yep, yeah, happy to chat. And uh, obviously, there'll be plenty of time at the end to, to discuss more or answer any questions that come up. Um, I always get into the habit of starting with the thank yous, because all of this is really a, a collective effort with uh, a larger group of people. But you know, a special thank you to uh, a couple of people. One is Andrea Sharp, who's a, a, a talented social worker, and then Pauline Murphy, who's a very talented nurse. And, you know, in 2013, 2014, when we started this uh, HIV prevention clinic at the Toronto General Hospital, we noticed some, some gaps in care with PEP and with PrEP, and uh, we started doing what's now known as PIP there. So huge kudos to Andrea and Pauline for all their help uh, launching PIP. Let's just, before we get into PIP, let's take a step back and think about current HIV prevention modalities. We obviously have PrEP. PrEP's fantastic. I mean, PrEP is, is revolutionizing HIV prevention. You know, obviously, uh, it's expanding pretty quickly. There's still a room for improvement, but it's it's done a remarkable job. And it, it's remarkable for people who are HIV negative, who have, you know, semi-frequent or frequent exposures to HIV we can use PrEP to significantly reduce the risk of HIV acquisition. And, you know, we have injectable PrEP, we have daily pills for PrEP, we have event-driven pills for PrEP. It, it, it really, really works well. Um, you know, I think one of the questions is how much prevention are we getting if there are significant adherence issues to either the injection or to your daily or event-driven PrEP? And then with the on-demand or event-driven PrEP, it's not entirely clear how effective that would be if you're using it very, very infrequently. And what I mean by very, very infrequently is you're using it maybe for one time a year or two or three times a year. The other issue too is, you know, it really is for exposures that are anticipated, not for unanticipated exposure. So while HIV PrEP is phenomenal and, and of course rolling out and expanding, uh, there are some limitations with PrEP. On the other end of the spectrum, we have PEP, post-exposure prophylaxis. You know, someone unfortunately has a, 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 an exposure to HIV, they seek care, they start uh, medications with as soon as possible and within a 72-hour window. And again, if you take those medications for 28 days, we know that that can significantly reduce the risk of HIV acquisition. Fantastic. It, it works really well. The problem is it only works well if you can get it. There are tremendous barriers to PEP access these days, even though this has been around for decades. We know the barriers are cost. We know that there's um, knowledge barriers, not just among the general public, but also among uh, 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 clinicians. Uh, we know there's issues with availability, stigma, follow-up. So while PEP in, in theory works extraordinarily well, there's real world barriers that are that are sadly getting in the way. So the take home point is, yes, we have some remarkable tools, but there's gaps in HIV prevention, preventative care. What we try to do is bridge those gaps with HIV PEP in pocket or with PIP. PIP is really a biomedical HIV prevention modality. And we really use this for people who have a low frequency of higher risk, often unanticipated exposures, not always unanticipated, but really lower, lower frequency high risk exposures. And here's what we do, it's remarkably simple. We identify people who have a lower risk of, or sorry, a lower frequency of high risk exposures, and we proactively give them the full course of post-exposure prophylaxis ahead of time. We say, here's a prescription, we'll help you fill the prescription, take this prescription and put that in your sock drawer and, and don't touch it. And if, you know, in zero, one, two, or three times a year, someone has a potential exposure to HIV, they already have their medication. They already have counseling on what to do. They just open up their sock drawer and start their medication as soon as possible. So it really lowers barriers to care. So patients can self-initiate 
pep following an exposure. And then, you know, on a much less urgent basis, you come and see us in clinic, you know, usually within the first week or so of starting the medication. And we can do the counseling and appropriate testing uh, to make sure that, uh, you know, all the routine tests are done for, for routine PEP care. It's, it's that easy. Um, here's the deal. We know that nobody wants to go to an emergency department at two o'clock in the morning and wait for four hours to talk to a total stranger about the anal sex they just had, the rape they just survived, the needle they just stuck in their arm that they might have shared with someone else. Okay. And then talk about that in a very public setting with a total stranger, only to have inconsistent follow up afterwards. No way. We treat adults like adults. We counsel people ahead of time. We give them the drugs ahead of time so that they can self initiate and follow up in an environment where they already have a, a relationship with the clinician. They are in a comfortable place and they know exactly what to do and they can have immediate access to HIV preventative care. It's, it really is that simple. And that is PEP in pocket or PIP. So who's using PIP these days? Pretty straightforward. It's people who are self-reporting anywhere from zero to four HIV exposures per year. That's, that's, that's who's really getting this. And, and, you know, it can include a lot of different people. You know, some people may all, almost always use condoms, but infrequently don't or can't. Maybe they had a condom break or they, you know, this happens once or twice a year. Maybe they've decided to stop using PrEP, but they still want a, a backup plan in case, you know, life happens and there's a potential exposure to HIV. Maybe people are infrequently sharing injection drug equipment. They almost never do, but you know, once or twice a year, it can happen. Some people are already on PrEP, either daily or on-demand PrEP, but they have, for whatever reasons, inconsistent adherence. And I'm not talking about you missed one pill on your, on your daily PrEP. I mean, there's a, there obviously is a bit of wiggle room and protection. I'm talking about significant ad adherence issues and, and a PIP might be a good backup plan. In, in those instances. And other times, you know, there might be people who have difficulty accessing PEP in emergency situations. You might live in a rural or a remote location. There might be lack of transportation. There might be stigma barriers or other barriers. And, and again, we can identify people ahead of time who are having zero, one, two, three, or even up to four exposures per year and provide them with this, uh, with the 28 days of PEP ahead of time so they can self-initiate. So ultimately, who ends up going on PIP? Some sex workers. Not all, but of course, some who may not be able to negotiate condom use. Some, not all, but some people who inject drugs. Some gay, bisexual men who have sex with men. Um, some people who might live in rural areas who have barriers to PEP. And, you know, again, these are just people with zero to four potential exposures, often anticipated, but not always unanticipated per year. The important thing, and we'll get to it later, is, you know, obviously nothing set in stone, right? If people are having more exposures, they can transition to prep, you know, daily injectable or on demand. Um, and, and we transition people between uh, various HIV prevention modalities all the time. We do it very, very frequently. <laughs> I like this slide because I like buffets. Uh, I like options. And I think this really, really makes the point of what we're doing with HIV prevention these days. So if you think about this side of the buffet table, you know, people who have many exposures or more frequent exposures to HIV, we've got injectable prep, we've got daily prep, we've got on-demand prep. It's fantastic. And then let's think about this side of the buffet table. You know, maybe at this end of the spectrum, there's people with zero or very, very few uh, exposures to HIV per year. Okay, we can do nothing. That's always an option. Or, you know, we give PEP in, in, in many of these situations. But like, look at this giant gap right in the middle there. And, you know, PIP fits in beautifully right around the spicy noodles, which are my favorite. So, you know, there are you know, more granular approaches to HIV prevention and, uh, and PIP fits in really nicely in the middle there. Okay. When I'm having this conversation with people, especially some people who are providing HIV preventative care, we often hear, you know what, that's good and all, but you know, my patients are all at very, very, very high risk. And the answer is, yeah, they probably are. They're on prep for a reason. Um, but you know, if you actually drill down, and there's a lot of data demonstrating this, I really like this paper from JAMA, it was published in 2019. 
you know, this looked at uh, patients who were on daily prep over the course of a year. And over 50% of participants had zero sexually transmitted infections over the course of a year. So while I'm saying, you know, some of these people uh, uh, who are on daily prep probably still really need to be on daily prep, but there's probably a proportion of, there's probably some chunk of those individuals where daily prep isn't necessarily the best option. And, you know, it's stating the obvious, people don't take a linear path through life, right? At certain times, they might have a very high risk for HIV acquisition. And of course, you know, daily prep or another prep modality is completely appropriate. But yeah, we don't take a linear path through life. And there might be other times where they're at very, very low risk. And maybe uh, daily prep is not the most appropriate option. And PIP or another HIV prevention modality is better suited. That's the importance of, you know, constantly following up with our patients and really rechecking and, and reassessing what their risk is and ensuring that people have access to the right HIV prevention modality at the right time. And again, like that buffet table analogy, you can always come back for more. <laughs> no, there's, we're not the gatekeepers here. You know, if you're on PrEP, but you want to move to PIP, fantastic. If you're on PIP and you're anticipating more exposures and you move back to PrEP, fantastic. You can always come back to the buffet table for more. So, you know, data is important and, and there's a growing database uh, demonstrating the utility of PIP. This is a, a big retrospective cohort study that we've done. Again, there's other studies out there. Uh, and, you know, I, 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 I would obviously, I think it's just important to go through some of this data. So this really, uh, this study looked at patients who were referred to two different study sites. Uh, they're usually referred from emergency departments or primary care providers or sexual health clinics. And typically the referrals were for people who either needed or were referred for PEP or PrEP. And, you know, what we do is we obviously discuss with patients their HIV prevention options, including PEP, PrEP, or in some cases, PIP. Um, and, and, you know, through shared decision making, and really it's the patients making the decision at the end of the day, we followed people who chose uh, to go on PIP as their primary HIV prevention modality, and we followed them uh, uh, you know, uh, and, and collected data on this. This data was collected between February 2016 and December of 2022 in two large HIV prevention clinics in Toronto. And then we extracted some data using standardized uh, a standardized tool. And we looked at demographic data, the duration of time on PIP, how often they use PIP, their adherence to PIP, any changes between their HIV prevention modality. And this is what we found. We ended up with uh, 112 different individuals using PIP in that time frame. And when we sum up all the years of PIP use during that time, it was about 184 years, uh, you know, huge age range, 18 to 69 years of age, with the average age being 37. Most of these individuals were male, uh, assigned male at birth. And, and, you know, just given the nature of the study, it was relatively short. There was about 1.6 years was the average duration that people were using PIP. Remember, people were moving back and forth between different HIV prevention modalities. Um, you know, of the 112 people that were prescribed PIP, 35 people, so about a third of the cohort, initiated PIP for sexual exposures. Um, and and uh, about two thirds of people never ended up initiating PIP. I mean, they had it, but they just, they just didn't need it or they did initiate it. Of the people that initiated PIP, 16 used it once and uh, 19 of them used it more than one time. So there was a total of 69 total courses of PIP initiated and zero that number is zero HIV seroconversions uh, during the course of the study. We followed up with patients. So 98.6% uh, of people completed HIV and STI testing within six months of self-initiating PIP. And, you know, I think this is an important number. It's easy to gloss over this, but, you know, we often talk about lost follow-up. We often talk about um, ensuring that uh, we have appropriate screening for HIV and how we're not screening broadly. Remember, many of these patients might have been ultimately referred for PEP, have completed their PEP, and we would have never seen them again. They're lost in the ether. Now with PIP, we've got them. We know who they are. We see people, you know, not very frequently, but you know, every five or six months or so, and we can continue to do HIV screening and, and, and check up on people to ensure that they're on the right HIV prevention modality. Even if no HIV prevention modality is appropriate, it's something that we can at least confirm. Um, PIP was discontinued on five occasions, uh, five occasions during the course of the study. 
four four times the provider said, you know what, this truly wasn't an HIV exposure. Well done for starting this. Thank you for coming into clinic. Doesn't look like it's needed, and and that was discontinued. And uh, only once did someone stop the medications due to side effects. Uh, of the patients that we had, nine uh, we have data available for ninety uh, looking at uh, bacterial STIs. And there were 22 uh, STIs among 13 individuals. So pretty comparable among what you'd see in a, you know, low to low moderate risk group uh, of, of individuals who are using PrEP. So yeah, they're obviously some people are, are, are getting STIs. And then the other key thing here, as I alluded to before, is there is a fluid transition between HIV prevention modalities. So during the course of the study, we had about a third of the cohort on PIP uh, transition to PrEP because they were having more frequent exposures. And during, you know, when we look at who's on PIP, we had about a third of people transition from PrEP to PIP because they were having a change in their uh, HIV risk and, and wanted a, a different HIV prevention modality when they were aware of what their options were. This is just to show you that there's other PIP studies out there. It's not just the one that I discussed that was just recently published in JADES in, uh, in 2023. You know, we've been providing this HIV prevention modality at the Toronto General Hospital HIV Prevention uh, Clinic since about 20, late 2013, early 2014. And it's started to take off. We know many people are using this in uh, other parts of the world. Uh, I think there's discussions about starting to integrate you know, this and other um, more, I guess, innovative HIV prevention strategies that lower barriers to HIV prevention into uh, guidelines and upcoming guidelines as well. So interestingly, uh, we're, this isn't published yet, but if you look at the cost effectiveness, one of the aims is to determine you know, what are the direct healthcare costs of PIP when you compare it to either daily or on-demand PrEP for people with a matched HIV risk. So uh, with MSM, uh, in the MSM population, you can use the HERI MSM score. So we, we have a modified HERI MSM score uh, and a, mo sorry, a modified risk score. But if you look at a population of HIV uninfected men and women, what we did was we looked at PIP users prospectively recruited from hospital sites, and we compared them to people who are using PrEP from a, a big prospective cohort study. And we, we matched them for their uh, HIV risk. They're one-to-one -one match, and they're matched based on the city, based on their age, and based on a modified measure of HIV risk. And we consider all the costs available, you know, the costs of the drug, the costs of the clinic, the costs of uh, screening uh, for STIs and, and, and HIV as well. So, you know, this is very preliminary and a big thank you to uh, Mia Sapin, who's a graduate student at the University of Ottawa, who's leading this with uh, Derek McFadden. Uh, but, um, you know, when the average age of this cohort, there's a uh, average age is 38. The average HIV risk score is uh, 10 points out of 26. So lower end of the spectrum. And if you look at the costs, you can see that the costs of PIP are much lower than the costs of, of PrEP. And in fact, PIP is 42.9% less costly per year for the same risk of uh, the same individual at, at, at low risk who is using PrEP. Um, one of the questions is, okay, how do you integrate this into routine practice? And you know, we've been doing this at the Toronto General Hospital HIV Prevention Clinic. That's theoretically what my hospital looks like, but every time I walk by it, it doesn't look nearly as beautiful. I think one of the other key messages of showing this slide of a giant quaternary care center is that this really isn't the ideal place for HIV prevention modalities to be offered. It really should be offered in community centers, community clinics, primary care, sexual health clinics, public health clinics, where the barriers to accessing care are lower. I mean, I'm very proud of the clinic that we set up and some of the innovations we've come out with, it, but uh, you know, obviously this is a barrier to care in and of itself. Our clinic's on the 13th floor of a massive hospital in downtown Toronto, and we really should be providing HIV care where people are and, and lowering barriers. But you know, how do we integrate this into our routine clinical practice? Pretty straightforward. First step is to identify candidates. And the easiest candidates to identify are people who are already on PrEP or people who are being referred for PEP. And again, the point is risk is not static, it's dynamic over time. So people might be at very high risk at certain points of their life and they and that might change at other points. So we talk about this with those on, on PrEP or people refer to on PEP. But of course, we also talk to people who are on no HIV prevention modalities as well, including uh, some gay, bisexual men who have sex with men, some people who are 
injecting drugs, um, sex workers, others who have barriers to HIV prevention that might have exposures, including you know, indigenous populations that might live in more remote indigenous locations or who uh, might live in urban locations but have tremendous barriers to care. So step one, identify your candidates. Step two is counseling. And the counseling is actually really straightforward. All we do is really discuss all the HIV prevention modalities available. We talk about the various uh, mechanisms that we can provide PrEP. We talk about PEP. We talk about just doing nothing, and we talk about PIP. We talk about some of the pros and cons of this. And again, this doesn't have to be a long, drawn-out conversation. Everyone's got a very busy clinic. You know, we can really summarize a lot of these in a minute or two and have a meaningful conversation where people understand what their options are, have an opportunity to ask questions. And then the key is to contextualize this into their individual circumstance. And, you know, we often ask, you know, how many potential exposures to HIV are you having? Obviously, that question is framed very carefully and worded more appropriately for the, the individual patient encounter. But we don't just ask how many they're having now. We talk about what do you expect is going to happen in the next few weeks or months ahead? Uh, because sometimes what's happening now is anticipated to change. And then, you know, I think the most important part of the conversation is people have to understand that nothing is set in stone, right? People are completely entitled to change their mind, to change their HIV prevention modality, uh, to come back to clinic. They're welcome back to clinic. Regardless, we're going to set a follow-up appointment anyways in a few months anyway, just to check up on people. And if things are working well, fantastic. Let's carry on carrying on. If they're not working well, fantastic. We can always switch to another HIV prevention tool that meets their needs. So the key point here is it's up to the patient. The third part is the prescription. And what we're providing for PIP is guideline approved PEP regimens, okay? Guideline approved PEP regimens. Depending on where people are in the world, the guidelines might differ. We adhere to the local guidelines. If you're in Canada, that might be very different than if you're in Australia or South Africa. We stick to the local, uh, with, this, with the local guidelines. Guidelines are obviously in flux, and uh, we know that they're being updated in many parts of the world right now. In general, in general, um, you know, for um, most uh, men who have sex with men, we're giving uh, Big Tarby. And uh, for women of childbearing age, we're giving you know, Truvada plus Dolutegravir. That's in general what we're using. But again, there's a lot of right options. And I think it's important that people stick to locally approved guidelines. The other interesting thing is, 28 days versus 30 day prescriptions. So PEP is really a 28 day prescription, but if you're working in a community setting and you're not in a, you know, a, a center or have a pharmacy that deals with a high volume of individuals who are receiving uh, any antiretroviral drugs, try writing a prescription for 28 days. You're gonna get a call from the pharmacist saying, you know, can we just give the 30 days when we pop the pill bottle, there's 30, you know, many of the bottles have 30 days of drugs or 30, 30, yeah, 30 doses or 30 days of drugs in there. So, you know, to save the patient some stress and anguish, to save you some stress and anguish, depending on the insurance status, oftentimes we'll write for 30 days, sometimes we'll write for 28 days. I leave it to you based on wherever it is you're practicing. And then the other key point is some of these drugs are inaccessible, they're hard to fill. We have the gift of time. Remember, people are only having zero, one, two, three, four exposures per year. So you have the gift of time. It's not an emergency. We'll help people navigate the local health network, the local insurance issues, the local barriers to care to ensure that they have assistance in filling the prescription so that they can put it aside and use it if necessary. And lastly is the follow-up. For people who are on PIP, I mean, they're having infrequent exposures. You don't need to see them as frequently as those on PrEP or, or other issues. So we usually say, you know, come back in five to six months or sooner if necessary. And if you're coming back sooner, you know, if you have an exposure, come back within a, a week of starting your medications. We're happy to see you. But in general, we, we, um, we see people every five to six months. And, you know, we screen for STIs. We screen for HIV. We screen for hepatitis C. We, everyone who's starting off on, on PIP, just like anyone who's starting off on, 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 on PrEP, we want to make sure that people are appropriately vaccinated to hepatitis A, hepatitis B. If it's someone who's at risk for uh, HPV, we always consider the HPV vaccine. And then at every clinic appointment, at every clinic appointment, we reevaluate the choice of the HIV prevention modality. We do this with the, our, the patients who are on PrEP. We do this with their patients who are on PIP. We do this with our patients who just come in for PEP. It's constantly reevaluating the HIV prevention modality. Is this the right modality for you at the right time, given the expected frequency of exposures that you're having? 
So the benefits of PIP, there's several. Number one, it provides protection for those with a lower frequency of higher risk, sometimes unanticipated exposures. It lowers, significantly lowers barriers, like significantly lowers barriers to HIV prevention care, right? You get immediate access to prevention. You don't have the need to go to an emergency department or an urgent care center, okay? You can start the pills as soon as possible. And most people are starting these medications within minutes to hours of an exposure, okay? Third thing is there's a decreased cost for uh, compared to daily prep, especially for those of comparable risk. You continue to have agency and autonomy over your care. And this is a more granular approach. You have more options. Patients have more options. Providers have more options. So you have a more granular approach to HIV prevention care. These are some key references. And I'll, the take home points are that PEP in pocket should really be considered as one of several biomedical HIV prevention options. And remember that people have a dynamic risk, dynamic HIV risk, right? This is not a linear path in life and we can match an appropriate HIV prevention tool for their current and near future risk. The next steps, we have uh, a couple of uh, large prospective studies that are ongoing. We're continuing with our community outreach. We're continuing to make patient education materials for various uh, patient groups and we're completing a cost effectiveness analysis. I thank you very much for your time. I'm happy to chat and answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bogash. Uh, really interesting. But uh, in the rush uh, to start the webinar, I forgot to introduce you correctly. Uh, oh. so a few words about Dr. Bogash. He's an associate professor at University of Toronto, Department of Medicine. He's at the University of Toronto, Department of Medicine. Any clinician investigator at the Toronto General Hospital Research Institute. Uh, so he trained at the University of uh, Toronto, but also he pursued an HIV fellowship at Massachusetts General Hospital and an infectious disease fellowship through the Harvard Partners uh, Program. And he also trained uh, with the Gorgas Memorial Institute and the Institute of Medicina Tropical in Lima, Peru. Uh, and he has a master's degree in clinical epidemiology. So that is why we have to get Dr. Bogash uh, on, uh, on the program. So very interesting. Uh, uh, it, it certainly uh, uh, seems like a, a very nice uh, opportunity to bring more people into HIV uh, prevention. Uh, so we have uh, questions from the audience. Please, uh, you can uh, put your question uh, in the question and, an and answer box. Uh, first question, what's the shelf life of the medication you use in PIP? Yeah, uh, great point and great question. Um, it's years, right? Uh, you, whenever you get the drugs, it'll have the expiration date printed on it, but usually it's a couple of years. So we don't really have an issue with uh, drugs expiring. Um, having said that, it's important to double check the expiration date and to remind people if they haven't used their PIP and you've seen them at follow up number one, follow up number two, follow up number three, you know, it's been a year and a half or so, it's important to remind people to have a peek at the drug expiration dates. And of course, there are times where uh, drugs expire and we just give people another prescription for, for their PIP and, uh, and they fill it and uh, they got another couple of years, the clock gets restarted. Thank you. But if I may uh, ask a, a similar question is uh, frequently pharmacists will put the date few months after they were served. So they're not necessarily the expiry date that is on the original bottle or the master bottle. Uh, so do you have to uh, make an arrangement with pharmacists? I've, I've never run into that issue. Um, I, I haven't. And, you know, it's, 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 People can, you know, if you bring the bottle into the pharmacy, they should be able to tell exactly what the expiration date is. Although that seems like a, an unnecessary barrier, it should really be clearly labeled on the on the bottle. But if I think there's any questions, you just bring the bring the bottle into the pharmacy and and just say, hey, how long are these good for? Here's the other thing that again, not not nice to talk about, and I don't think we'll go down this pathway. But there's a big controversy right now about how accurate are these expiration dates. Uh, and could they be far longer than they are already posted, which is likely true, but I don't tell patients that because we don't know yet. And until we have a, a formal policy, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to promote that, but, um, 
it's very likely that these drugs are active far longer than the expiration date. Thank you. So we have the question, can you go through your two-minute counseling spiel on the HIV prevention options like you would with a patient? No, thank you for asking. No, I, <laughs> I hate acting. But, you know, essentially, I talk about what HIV, what PrEP is. And I talk about daily PrEP, event-driven PrEP, and injectable PrEP, which, quite frankly, we're not really using a lot of injectable PrEP in Canada at the moment, but that might change. Okay. And I talk about, you know, what PrEP is, how to access the drugs, how to use it, especially event-driven PrEP. Um, then I talk about PEP and I talk about other options, uh, including PEP or, or doing nothing. And then I tell people about PIP and I say, listen, you know what, if you're having, you know, we always ask before, before we get to presenting the options, you're sort of tailoring the conversation to the individual. So if someone says, you know, I having, you know, I'm in a mostly monogamous, very stable relationship. Um, you know, and they're confident that, you know, their partner isn't, um, you know, uh, having relations outside of that relationship or, or, you know, someone who's almost never sharing injection drug paraphernalia or someone who almost always wears a condom, but just doesn't once or twice a year for whatever reason, you know, we tailor the counseling to the individual. But essentially, when I talk about PIP, I said, you know, here, you know, for, for very infrequent and sometimes unanticipated exposures, there's 28 days of medication. We'll help you fill the prescription. There's no rush to do it, but we'll, we can help you with that this week. You put it away. Don't look at it. Don't think of it. And, you know, in the situation where something happens, you start those medications as soon as possible and within a 72-hour window. Uh, take them every day, one pill once a day or whatever regimen they're on, the appropriate number of pills per day. Take them for the 28 days. Try and make your way to our clinic as, as soon as you can or to an, any other clinic for routine baseline testing like HIV, sexually transmitted infection testing, hep C screening, you know, the, the standard baseline test that should be done. And, uh, you know, and then if, if people are taking it, we can always reevaluate if PIP is still the right option. Um, if people are taking their PIP frequently. So someone, you know, they might have, taken it two times uh, in, in a six month period of time, we'll always ask, hey, you know what, is this still the right HIV prevention modality for you? Would you like to switch to one of the PrEP options? So these are just ongoing conversations. I think if we stop compartmentalizing HIV risk and stop compartmentalizing our HIV prevention tools and think of it as more of a fluid uh, process and dynamic change, I think we'll serve patients a lot better. We have a lot of ping ponging back and forth between prep for, you know, five, six, seven months, a year or something. And then they're on PIP. Well, you know, life changes happen, but then they go on prep again. So I think there, there's a lot of transitions back and forth. And it's just, it's really easy to do. You've got a patient in your office, or maybe you're doing this online. And you just ask, how's it, how's it going? You know, how, how frequently are you having, you know, condomless sex or, you know, how frequently are, are, are needles or paraphernalia being shared? You know, sad, you know, it's also some very other challenging conversations as well with sex workers, right? Sometimes sex workers can't negotiate condom use and, and they're being assaulted. This is awful. So I think there's, um, you know, a lot of uh, potential to expand PIP in, uh, in the sex worker population. Thank you. Someone is asking, can we see the reference slide again? And uh, while you're yeah. preparing that, just reminding people that uh, the recording will be uh, posted on IUSTI Canada uh, website uh, in uh, maybe a week, uh, 10 days. Uh, so you can um, uh, see it again or refer uh, colleagues uh, to it. There we go. Thank you. No problem. I'll keep that up for a minute. Mm -hmm. So a question, I assume there's some counseling on potential side effects when PIP is given to patients. Are there yeah. educational materials provided along with the actual medication? After all, it may be some time between when someone gets PIP and start using it. Uh, there could be several months at least. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, no, I don't. Yeah, we we do have pamphlets, but uh, and they're available in our clinic. Although I got to say, I don't think I've ever handed out a pamphlet with the clinic. It's PEP, right? It's just PEP, and we're not using the PEP from. I was going to say the bad old days, but uh, it really weren't that bad. Although the PEP was used, you know, I think in the up until 
uh, what do you think? 2016, we're still using a lot of those protease inhibitors. So people before had some really nasty, you know, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, terrible GI side effects where people would not complete their, their PEP regimens. But nowadays, um, you know, these PEP regimens that are being used are, are you know, we're using, you know, Victarvi, we're using, you know, Truvada and, and Dolly Tegrever. And of course there can be side effects. Of course there can. But I think it's also fair to remember that people are taking these regimens for forever for their HIV uh, treatment. Uh, and we're, we're only using them for a month for HIV prevention. So yes, of course there can be side effects, but we also have to be realistic in that, you know, many of these side effects are either transient or, or mild. So, you know, some people might have some GI upset. It's not all that common. And if it happens, it usually self-resolves within the first 48 hours. Some people might have a, a headache. And again, it's usually transient and it usually self-resolves within the first 48 hours. Most people won't even know they're taking any, any medications. We cancel people that this, this can happen. We cancel people that it's typically mild, typically self-resolves. If there's any issues, give us a shout. Thank you. Someone is asking, uh, who typically prescribes PIP? Is it restricted to ID specialists? Absolutely not. Again, I think it has to be framed for wherever it is people are practicing. Uh, but most places, it is absolutely not restricted to IV special, ID specialists. Uh, primary care uh, can, can prescribe it. I'm, I think in some places, nurse practitioners might be able to prescribe it. It just depends on what part of the world you're in. So I think it's important to ask, ask locally. But the vast majority of places would not be restricted to ID specialists. Thank you. Uh, can you comment on need for renal function testing once you start on PIP? Additionally, when I provide PEP, I do a rapid HIV test and HIV serology. Can you comment on risk associated with the patient who may actually have HIV and they start on PEP? Yeah, great point. So two things. One, renal function. So, you know, at the baseline visit, at the first visit, I would get a renal function test. I absolutely, I, I think that's that's an important part of the um, uh, tests that are, that are performed. Let's also not let perfection get in the way of really good. Remember, we're dealing with, you know, generally, not exclusively, but generally a younger cohort. Uh, you know, and I'd, I'd ask people to think back to all of the patients that they've seen over the last year and what proportion of them have elevated creatinines. The next thing I'd remind people is that we're using this medication for 28 days. It's not, you know, HIV treatment where people are on this for forever. So, you know, Yes, we should get a renal function test before, but if you don't have one, or maybe you know you prescribe PIP, but the person self initiates it one year later, we're going to be fine the vast majority of the time. I think we've got to keep in mind this is a very good harm reduction approach, and it doesn't have to be absolutely perfect uh, in terms of making sure the you know creatinine is measured within you know the week of self initiating the medication. Um, there was a second part to this question. I just don't remember exactly what it was. Can you comment on risk associated with the patient who may actually have HIV and they start on PEP? Yeah, I mean, part of the, before starting PIP, we obviously have to make sure people are HIV negative. So we, we certainly do HIV screening before initiating, before initiating PIP. Remember, this is basically uh, 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 PrEP. But having said that, you know, some people might uh, between the time PIP is prescribed and but the time PIP is self-initiated, yeah, some people may have another exposure and 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 be HIV positive. You know, that's that's obviously you know uh, something that needs to be considered. But remember, PIP is is PEP. It's 28 days of medication and it, it's it's three drugs. So this is treatment. Uh, this would be considered HIV treatment. So. I think if we're looking at, are you worried about generating, you know, uh, resistance uh, in 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 individuals, the risk is probably far, far, far lower using a three drug regimen than it is using a two drug regimen. And the next component too is, you're not starting PIP on people who are at high risk for HIV acquisition. Like these are individuals who are carefully selected. So these are people who are really having, you know, zero, one, two, three exposures per year, and you're following up on people with some degree of regularity. So if they are having more frequent HIV exposures, you're probably switching them ahead of time to another HIV prevention modality, such as PrEP. 
So I think the likelihood, while not zero, is is low if this is done well. And the safety is a lot better providing three drugs rather than two drugs. Thank you. Is there a significant cost differences for patients by province? Probably. I'm not going to pretend to know all the intricacies of each province's uh, methods for, you know, acquiring antiretroviral medications. And that's why I think it's so important to act locally uh, and really sort out the uh, local mechanisms for acquiring acquiring these medications. I, I practice in Ontario, um, and I know that we've had very little, actually very few issues getting the right people on the right HIV prevention modality. Yes, of course, I recognize that it's far from perfect. There needs to be significant improvements. We need to lower barriers. Um, and I certainly lean very heavily on uh, a social worker who works very closely uh, with me in, in our clinic. And not everyone has access to the, those same resources. But, um, you know, I think HIV prevention is really, you know, an interdisciplinary team effort. And uh, as a clinician, I'm but one member of the team. And I, I, I very strongly uh, lean on the tremendous abilities of, of uh, the social worker who's part of the team. Yeah, the next question is uh, pretty much a following what you just answered. It is great to have options here. And while we understand that maybe only clinicians or nurses can prescribe PIP, but is there a possibility to task share counseling from clinician to social workers or counselor who can engage in conversation to evaluate risk and help clients make decision on what is best for them? Yeah, I think that's a brilliant idea. By no means should the counseling uh, be restricted to you know doctors or nurses or nurse practitioners. I think even beyond social workers, I think community outreach, uh, people who work in community outreach and community, uh, those who are involved with community engagement, I think uh, obviously uh, that would be a, a very important cohort to include. And, you know, a lot of the work we're doing right now is, is exactly that. It's reaching out to, in Ontario, we call them ASOs or AIDS service organizations um, and other uh, organizations that really help uh, advocate and represent you know, sex workers, indigenous communities, uh, marginalized populations, G the GBMSM population, et cetera, just to sensitize them that there's other HIV prevention tools out there. Here's how you talk to communities. Here's some information for communities. Here's some information for clients. And in fact, there are uh, PIP or people who know how to provide PIP. Um, there's a growing number of clinicians that are comfortable doing this uh, globally, but also here in, in Canada. And, um, you know, for example, in Ontario, we have several um, online uh, HIV prevention um, programs. Uh, so people can access those HIV prevention programs online. They don't have to actually come into a clinic and there's providers on there that are knowledgeable in you know, obviously PrEP, but also PEP and now PIP. So I think we need to, you know, there's going to be a growing number of people in the general community who will be interested or aware of PIP as a potential HIV prevention option but also a growing number of clinicians who will, who will be aware of this as well with, with time. It's very similar to when PrEP was rolling out. You know, it just took a bit of time and effort to engage communities and engage clinicians and ensure everyone's aware of what their HIV prevention options are and then you know, train clinicians on how to best provide them. Thank you. Uh, what exactly are the considered risk factors for HPV? Oh, I mean, it's there's no different, right? I think if uh, if actually it's pretty interesting, you know. I, if you ask, if you lined up fifty different clinicians, you'd probably get fifty different answers for who should be vaccinated for HPV. My personal bias is I'm I'm rather liberal with it. I, I usually offer it. Uh, people might be. Uh, you know, considered maybe a little bit older than what others would consider. But, I, you know, I, if, if this is totally my bias and I fully appreciate that people have different answers to this. But if you look at HPV recommendations over time, it started off as a very narrow focus of individuals. And over a few years, you're seeing gra a gradual expansion of eligibility, gradual expansion of eligibility, gradual expansion. And, you know, soon it's just going to be, hey, everyone should get this under the age of, you know, pick a a number that's pretty high, you know, like 
60 or something like that. That's just a prediction. I have no idea if that's going to happen. But, uh, you know, for example, in men who have sex with men, I think obviously should be uh, should be getting this vaccine and, you know, any others with risk factors for, for HPV infection. Great. So uh, those were the questions that were asked uh, at this moment. I would like uh, to thank you. Uh, it was a very uh, good presentation, very practical uh, uh, webinar. So we thank you very much. I would just want to remind people that uh, the uh, recording of this webinar will be available on uh, the IUSCI uh, Canada uh, website. Uh, we'll send you information about the December webinar uh, in a few days. Uh, and I would like uh, finishing to thank uh, Dr. Bradley Stoner, who pointed us toward the, the presentation of Dr. Bogash. And thank you, uh, Greg Penny, for the logistics uh, and the, uh, uh, the logistic and the uh, publicity. Uh, so thank you all and talk to you uh, uh, in December. Have a great day. Thanks, everybody. Bye.